Um, I think we are going to start hearing from Mason, who's just going to ground us with some historical examples to, you know, understand how dual power has successfully been built in the past in different settings. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about what symbiosis is since we've been gesturing at that for a few days. And then I think Katie and Mason will go through some of the sort of principles of organizing as we drive toward uh, Q&A and breakout discussions. Uh, and we'll take a break somewhere in the middle of all that. So I guess Mason, you wanna kick it off? Yeah, can you all hear me? All right, I'm gonna be juggling a couple different notes on different screens, so bear with me. Um, I want to drop in the chat a few accompanying readings for those of you who are interested afterwards in diving into some of this in greater detail. Um, and so I'm gonna do three of different lengths. The first uh, being this short essay by Tim Horace with Philly Socialists on um, base building um, for something quick and easy. Uh, second, um, a longer essay that Katie and I and a few others wrote. Um, that was the first publication that Symbiosis Research Collective on many of these questions, just elaborated. And then lastly, um, is this book that was put together by the folks at Cooperation Jackson called Jackson Rising that goes into some of the details of um, how they envision their, um, their political program and, uh, and organizing initiatives being implemented in the real world. Um, so I'm just gonna start with some of where uh, I believe Katie left off yesterday um, with the Russian Revolution. Um, this being the first instance historically in which um, a mass movement was articulated in terms of dual power as the source of its um, revolutionary potential. And so for those of you who um, may not have been there for, for Katie's discussion of this yesterday, um, in essence, after the czar was toppled and seemingly all bets were off in society, um, many thousands of ordinary workers organized themselves into directly democratic assemblies um, organized around each workplace that were called the Soviets. And during this time, the, um, the official government, uh, the provisional government had very little power um, because they didn't really have much popular legitimacy. And it wasn't clear uh, to what extent they had any democratic mandate whatsoever because they were a self-declared government. And on the other hand, alongside that, people had these um, participatory forms of self-government that um, you know, they knew that if they engaged with would directly uh, respond to, to their needs and demands. And so we have a system in which you have two poles of power that are coming into conflict with one another. And one of the, um, the interesting commentaries on this at the time said that um, the Soviets held a gun to the head of the provisional government um, because they were not just organized as in factory workers, but also the soldiers had their own committees that would just make decisions and could um, implement what they wanted to do. And, um, and this is why Kelly's discussion of Hannah Arendt and her conception of power is so essential because the source of real power that is present here is the capacity to move people collectively. And if the organs of participatory self-democratic governance are more capable and more embedded in the lived experience of ordinary people and can channel their collective action, um, more effectively than the state can, um, then the state has very little power and is in an uh, extraordinarily precarious position. Um, so that's kind of the underlying theme that I want us to be thinking about these coming three examples through um, that I'm gonna talk about a little more detail um, in which the, um, 
the power of these movements is that they can sap the authority of the state and um, and contest it for for popular legitimacy. Um, so, two other themes I want to note um, that are really on clear display in the Russian Revolution that are critical for um, these three case studies I'm gonna go into more detail on. Um, the first is that there's this sudden emergence of participatory forms of direct self-government in moments of political crisis. And this is something that actually Hannah Arendt in particular has um, done a lot of, of writing and discussion of in across her work um, about how in every single revolutionary moment um, across history, as, as soon as the dominant system um, falls to pieces, what people immediately latch onto as um, a reliable alternative is assembly democracy and face-to-face -face forms of direct self-government. Um, but second, somewhat in contrast, I want to note that these do not come entirely out of nowhere. Uh, there are very few examples of effective mass uprisings whose organizational forms were entirely conjured up in the heat of the struggle. Um, obviously in the context of uh, the Soviets in the Russian Revolution, they had been initially uh, organized in 1905 during that attempted revolution and had become, been vehicles for um, labor struggle uh, in the intervening period um, with um, for amount of revolutionary mass movements. Um, and so the, um, like you never know when, when the spark for a revolutionary crisis will emerge, um, but there are certain preconditions for um, that being uh, able to be converted into popular rebellion. And those preconditions are largely organizational. They're dependent on the existing relationships, um, between between people and the kinds of popular mass organizations that have been active prior um, that become infused with uh, new surges of popular energy that, that had not yet been present. And there are further preconditions for translating you know, moments of rebellion into the actual transformation of society itself into, into revolution. Um, just to draw on um, some James and Grace Lee Boggs there. Um, and um, so the examples that are going to walk us through, uh, I didn't pick because they're the most effective movements in history per se, because I, but because I think each is particularly useful in illustrating in their own way how dual power as an organizing principle operates in practice and what are nuts and bolts of um, the actual relational organizing that is their bedrock. Um, that is often often goes unseen um, in how we how we talk about them. Um, so first one I'm going to talk about is the Z Zapatista uprising in Mexico. The second will be the first Palestinian Intifada, uh, which is an uprising against the uh, military occupation of the Palestinian territories back in the 80s and 90s. And the third will be the ongoing struggle um, in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and their experiments in uh, economic democracy and uh, people's assemblies. Um, and I think I'll get right in. Um, you know, feel free to, as always, to just drop questions in the chat and i um, happy to talk about them um, a little bit later. So, um, all righty. So um, the Zapatista Rebellion um, is an ongoing um, process and um, emerged out of the indigenous peasant struggles of uh, Chiapas, Mexico. So uh, Chiapas um, uh, has been the poorest state in Mexico and uh, the most underdeveloped. Um, during the Mexican Revolution back in the early 20th century, there um, was pretty dramatic like transfer of power um, in most of the country where peasants seized and um, broke up the 
um, haciendas of the of the landlord class of the the landed um, planter class. Um, but Chiapas unfortunately actually experienced the opposite during the revolution. They had a, a counter revolution in which um, reactionary forces um, were able to consolidate their power uh, in a really um, damaging way. And so by the 1980s. Um, in Chiapas, there is literal slavery um, on many of these haciendas. Um, there are almost no roads built in the state. Um, the present of the state and federal government in the in the altos, which is like the, the highlands, um, is basically non-existent, and um, is more or less entirely ruled by. Uh, these these landed elites, um, and so the the origins of the um, EZLN, the Zapatista National Liberation Army, was actually in the Mexican Student Movement, um, where you know they they had these these radical um, efforts during the 1960s, much like all over, all over the rest of the world, um, and so there were some a number of students who uh you know formed revolutionary organizations and they thought they were going to go out into the countryside um teach the people about marx lenin and mao and um you know engage in a um a people's war and um carry out a marxist revolution to to overthrow the government and bring um you know implement a communist state in in mexico and um and so <laughs> a number of them actually did uh, march up into the the mountains of, of Chiapas, and um, you know the most the most well known of, of these people is of course uh, uh, Subcomandante Insurgente Marcos, who was a, a philosophy professor in Mexico City before this. Um, and uh, well, initially they they were their effort was a complete failure. Um, they realized that. They're not, they, they were not going to be effective if they frame their approach into, um, you know, the, the peasantry of, of um, indigenous parts of Mexico um, as we are, um, we are missionaries here to convert you to um, the, the correct political line. And, you know, it's important to keep in mind that in, in these parts of Mexico, a majority of people don't even speak Spanish. Um, they're, they're speaking uh, Zotzil and other Mayan languages and um, they, their, their experience of failure in trying to um, kind of do this go to the people um, revolutionary approach um, forced them to take many, many steps back and begin instead by trying to build relationships with people um, who are there and uh, spend far more of their time listening and um, learning about the experiences of of those that they were trying to organize um and so what what emerged out of about a decade of um engagement and um you know learning learning their language and culture and everything else was um just a, a radical transformation in what the actual political goals and forms of this movement uh would be so um, many of the basic assumptions of, of Marxist politics were thrown completely out the window. Um, they envisioned themselves not as um, pursuing some sort of dictatorship of the proletariat, but um, participatory self-government uh, through um, kind of rooted in the um, people's assemblies that were part of um, indigenous culture and kind of had been the default mode of uh, of collective decision making up to that point, um, and you know there was there was lots of really hard work of um, actually organizing people, and so the two main um, approaches that they took to do this was um, most all the recruitment was done by uh, by women who could move from village to village in a way that was uh, less suspicious. Um, uh, through through kind of like uh, medical exchanges and and things of that nature, and then secondly that um, they they planned armed self defense against the basically the hired guns of the ostentados and um, 
and so that's kind of like the foundation on, on which this was this was being built. Um, and the women's struggle is really really central in in all of this. Um, I mean, most in most indigenous assemblies in Mexico, as they're uh, traditionally constituted, women are denied a voice. Um, but because this was kind of more self-consciously framed as a revolutionary project, um, you know, there's there's lots of parallels with the struggle in Rojava, in which um, there was a conscious attempt at shedding the patriarchal gender norms um, in the construction of, of this new society. And today, in in people's assemblies in in uh, Chiapas, um, women are like the overwhelming majority of participants and occupy most of the Zapatista leadership positions. Um, and you know the, the autonomous territory is uh, ruled by what's called the Women's Revolutionary Law, which um, guarantees women's equality in, across many sites. And so the only time, but the thing is, no one knows any of this is happening. It's kind of completely under the radar. There's almost no presence of the state. And the only time anyone ever heard of the Zapatistas was in 1994, when the uh, when NAFTA came to effect and. Um, this was declared to be a death sentence to the indigenous people of Mexico um, because it, it resulted in the repealing of part of the Mexican constitution uh, that had been um, implemented during the revolution in the early 20th century that basically protected social property, um, just like the communal ownership and management of land. And um, even today, a majority of the, the territory of Mexico is actually social property. It's not owned by the state and it's not owned as private property. Um, and so they they stream down out of the mountains in um, sort of a, a mock uh, uh, armed rebellion because, you know, there were, some of them did have guns, but many of them were carrying sticks that were painted to look like guns and um, seize control of um, a variety of towns. And um, there was there were some shootouts with with the government, but um, it was more like announcing their their presence in the world and um, and through that uh, you know establishing autonomous control over the territories um, up in the up in the highlands um, and beginning an extended process of negotiation with um, with the Mexican government. And so to this day. Um, in, a, in really in a uh, steadily expanding way, um, this sort of participatory form of uh, indigenous sovereignty in Chiapas um, has been able to sustain itself. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, along um, communalist and socialist lines. And um, there's, there's just, um, absolutely no way in which the the state itself has uh, real power in the territories under their control. Um, and I guess that's all I'll say about the Zapatistas, except um, I think we also need to keep in mind like the incredible ripple effects of this rebellion in uh, popular movements around the world. Um, I think it's uh, would not be controversial to say that the alter globalization movement would never have happened were it not for uh, this uprising against really against uh, free trade um, and um, really re-inspired the global left in terms of uh, its political imagination for um, you know, new forms of, of democracy and autonomy. Um, and you know, I think without that, then there's no Occupy no Bernie, et cetera. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there on the, on the Zapatistas. Happy to answer any further questions uh, about that. But, um, you know, this is, this is very much an instance of um, brick by brick organizing, building control over people's own lives um, against uh, and independent of the state. Um, the next example, I'll use is the uh, first Palestinian Intifada, um, which is um, much less often uh, talked about as a um, uh, a movement that uh, we could describe with dual power, but I think it very clearly is. Um, so um, the first Intifada broke out in 1987 after 20 years of military occupation um, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And 
um, began as um, really a um, kind of general uh, unrest and popular rebellion, mass demonstrations, um, throwing rocks at tanks and um, all these really powerful images of people taking the streets. Um, but what, what is almost never talked about um, is the um, organizing in the about 15 years prior that um, laid, laid the groundwork for, uh, for this and um, gave rise to um, a dual power in the occupied territories. Um, and this, this one, um, I, I can answer your questions about more detailed way because this is the subject of my um, undergraduate uh, thesis research and, um, uh, and field work. Um, but what's, what basically happened during the late 70s and 1980s is that there was this uh, dramatic expansion of Palestinian civil society um, uh, in the forms of different kinds of neighborhood level organizing, um, both against the occupation, but also to um, meet people's immediate needs. Um, one of the one of the most important uh, aspects of this uh, burgeoning radical movement in the in the territories is the women's movement, um, which um, which began through. Um, basically like middle-class uh, feminists going out to talk with women who live in the refugee camps in the villages and trying to articulate um, and, and organize for um, improving their conditions. Obviously, Palestinian society is extraordinarily patriarchal and um, they were kind of, uh, they, had, they had multiple fronts of their struggle, both within, um, within the family and Palestinian society um, and also against the external conditions of, of occupation and military domination. And so they organized themselves into what were called women's committees, which were like these local um, assemblies of women um, by each village and, and camp and, and town um, that would bring women together. They would form cooperatives together um, to provide childcare to each other, all to uh, expand the economic independence of women in the home um, and, uh, you know, engage people politically in, um, in, in their communities. Um, and, um, you know, there, there are other, other dimensions to this, um, but basically each, each of these women's committees were organized nationally into a confederation of um, basically radical organizing women. Um, that, that scaled from the neighborhood level to the district all the way up to the top um, as kind of like participatory democratic and explicitly socialist organizations. Um, and so when, when the Intifada uh, broke out, um, there was already in place this architecture of, uh, of social engagement and uh, political organizing um, that was organized on the local level. And um, so the women's committees were often the backbones of this, but there are other organizations like the local party f uh, functions, um, the, the unions and, and student movements. Um, and when shit was really hitting the fan um, with um, like curfews getting declared and tanks rolling in um, and the total basically collapse of uh, of administration in the territories. These groups came together uh, at the local scale to um, carry out, you know, like participatory self-government. Um, and these were usually referred to as popular committees um, that um, became the backbone of the struggle for um, the entirety of the uprising. Um, and so these, these popular committees were, um, you know, in charge of everything related to sustaining society and caring for the struggle against the occupation at their local level. Um, you know, doing things like uh, organizing barricades, distributing food, ensuring that after the schools were closed, they could still educate their kids in like someone's living room. Um, they would do, me distribute medical aid, basically everything you can imagine 
um, even were really active in developing what we now call a solidarity economy um, to sustain people during the strikes and um, boycotts. They used the, the term the home economy because uh, they were basically trying to foster self-sufficiency such that it was possible for people to um, boycott Israeli goods. Um, and so um, these, these were also scaled uh, into uh, something called the unified leadership, national leadership of the, of the uprising. So each popular committee would send a delegate to a committee kind of coordinating activities at that um, you know, like district or citywide level, which would then send them up to kind of a more regional scale. And they went up like four or five scales all the way to um, this national uh, group that was the one that put out all of the communiques and the leaflets explaining national strike dates and things like that. Um, and so, you know, they would rotate people around because everyone's always getting arrested or having their skulls bashed in or like, all, like the repression here is extreme. Um, and there's a lot of attempts at infiltration, but um, because they um, were not like just listening to um, a, an established party organization, but it was kind of part of a, a fluid structure um, of, of confederal demo, uh, direct democracy, um, it, this was actually pretty re resilient to, um, to repression. And, um, was was also really effective at taking ideas that people would come up with at their local level and um, spreading them out over over all the territories. Um, so one example of this is that um, there was this one village outside of Nablus whose popular committee came up with the idea of doing a tax strike because taxes like Palestinians paid really heavy taxes that went to pay for their own occupation, and so. Um, the, that idea like went up the chain through um, the different levels of uh, the popular committees. It went out in a leaflet to everyone, like maybe you should try this. And uh, a town outside of Bethlehem called uh, Beit Sahur, like went all the way on, on this tactic. And um, it, it kind of became uh, world news because, you know, they would have uh, soldiers begging um, s some old man to like pay a single, a single uh, shekel in taxes um, and they would let him off completely and he refused and so they had to like take all his furniture out of his house. Um, that same community also, um, you know, operated their own uh, hidden dairy uh, facility to provide milk to, to the kids in the town. Um, during during the during the strikes and um, went on this wild goose chase with the IDF trying to find their cows and and uh, confiscate them. Um, but so what what we had what was developed through through this kind of uh, grassroots organizing structure is a form of of government. Like this is a an oppositional power that is coordinating the activities of people from the local to the national level, in which all ordinary people have the ability to participate in and shape. Um, but in opposition to, as a counterpower to the state, um, being the the military occupation regime, and um, you know ultimately this was. Um, crushed and defeated. Most of their main organizers were um, arrested and deported or imprisoned. Um, but you know, this is this was the most effective and um, broad-based mass movement in Palestinian history, uh, and is really directly responsible for the beginning of the peace process in in the 1990s. Um, okay, and. Then lastly, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, Jackson. This one will be a little bit shorter. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, the the radical struggle in Jackson um, has really only been in the public consciousness since 2014 when they won a mayoral election, uh, but has been ongoing since the 1970s. Um, so, you know, the, which is in some ways um, at the, the height of the 
um, Black Freedom Movement. There was an initiative to um, basically establish an autonomous uh, Black nation within the territories of the United States in the Black majority um, counties of the South, um, which was the, called the idea of the Republic for, uh, of New Africa. Um, and uh, so this was this was begun as, as kind of a black nationalist struggle um, building on some of the um, ideas of the of the black power movement in the preceding decade so um, various various black radicals um, kind of m moved to the Mississippi River Valley um, to begin um, developing um, you know, mass movements in, excuse me, in the, in the black majority, um, counties. Um, and so this kind of came together in a plan that was developed on behalf of the Malcolm X grassroots movement. It's called the Jackson Cush plan, um, which, you know, is, is linked in the, or described in the, uh, book I linked before. Um, and so the Jackson Cush plan is, is basically a vision for how to establish autonomy for black people in the United States who live in this uh, territory um, that's got three main pillars. Um, the first is the development of um, a solidarity economy in the region in which black workers themselves directly own and control the um, means of production and can you know establish uh, self-determination in economic terms. The second is the uh, development and proliferation of people's assemblies as a dual power within the region um, of collective democratic self-governance um, to to guide um, the the movement as a whole and um, as a counterpart of the state. Um, and then lastly, the third was to um, build a, um, an independent black uh, radical political party in the region um, to um, basically disentangle themselves politically from the Democratic Party. Um, so in Jackson, um, which has kind of been the center of, of this um, over the past several decades, there's been um, a dramatic um, uh, like proliferation of uh, assembly-based organizing. This really um, got kick-started by Hurricane Katrina, where, you know, we often think of New Orleans as being the only victim, but also the coast, uh, the Gulf Coast of Mississippi was uh, devastated by Hurricane Katrina. And so um, one of the ways in which disaster response was mobilized was through uh, people's assemblies. Um, and, you know, to this day, People's movement assemblies are, uh, I think, I believe, stronger in the American South than anywhere in the country as a as a living um, political tradition. Um, and so that's that's how people assemblies kind of um, were brought into Jackson as a as a means of organizing. Um, so what they did in you know over the course of that decade was um, bring in ordinary people through these assemblies get. Uh, generate ideas of like what could be most important for transforming people's lives. And that was the basis of initially running a candidate in, um, in local elections. So they um, nominated through the assembly um, a man named Chakwe Lumumba, who is uh, um, a black radical lawyer from Detroit, um, who initially ran for city council and won and um, and then in uh, several years later, ran for mayor. Um, so Cooperation Jackson is known by a lot of people. Um, it's important to clarify that its function is only for the, that first pillar of the Jackson Cush plan, the development of the solidarity economy. Um, the, the assemblies themselves are not contained under um, Cooperation Jackson organizationally, but they are kind of conceived as um, related and interwoven social projects. Um, you know, there have been, there have been lots of challenges in Jackson. I don't want to imply that, um, you know, they've got everything down, um, and are on the continual up and up, but, 
um, as far as uh, you know, illustrating how um, hard, steady work at organizing in one's community can um, really build these the basis of, of dual power and, um, and so forth. I think it's a fantastic example. And, um, you know, there are people that you can easily reach out to and, and chat with. Um, I don't know if 16 is on as um, she is. Um, so I think for any for questions on Jackson, I'll just direct them to to her. It's, um, she's done some more ongoing field work there. Um, so there's a bunch of questions. Um, I could do some like final wrap up framing here, but do we do we want me to tackle these now or wait until the other two of you go? I think we could keep up to just the three or four that have been raised already. And you could go through them quick, then they might be a little bit more, uh, you know, in people's minds based on your, what you just discussed, and then we can move on. Is that right for you, Kelly? Yeah, it looks like there's a couple about uh, Chiapas and the Zapatistas, and maybe one about the Intifada. Okay. Um, yeah, the only last thing I'll say then is just that in all three of these cases, there's a very clear iceberg effect where what, what elevates these movements into public consciousness is only like the final outcome of many years of organizing, relationship building, and development of these counter institutions. Um, it is the not sexy, not um, glamorous work that is the precondition for, uh, for the fireworks, so to speak. And um, that, that often gets missed in how these things are um, narrativized um, generally. And so, you know, I, I, I encourage everyone to, to work on the, or to emphasize the, the hard slog that comes before. Um, okay, so uh, first question is, what was the soul of the Zapatista movement? Was it to overthrow the government or, and set up a new system? or was it to transform the existing government? That is a great question. It's, um, it, I guess, depends on when you're talking. So when the Zapatistas first came down out of the mountains, the idea was sort of that um, other people elsewhere around the country would do the same and we would like all declare autonomy and the, the federal state would, would collapse and we'd have a new, new system of, um, of, of government, um, it was very much not to transform the existing government. And so it's been very clear that they're not intent on um, taking power through the state as it's presently constituted. Um, the one exception to this uh, hard line for the Zapatistas was in the latest um, presidential election in which for the first time the Indigenous National Congress, which is kind of like the national organization of um, indigenous communities around the country, um, put forward an indigenous candidate. And so the Zapatistas lent her support, as in like encouraged people to vote for her. Um, and that is the only time in which they've ever dabbled in um, you know, reform within, within the Mexican state. Um, okay, I've heard of anti-capitalist economies that exist in uh, Chiapas, El Cambalache uh, comes to mind. Do you, do you think this is possible because there's a foundational communalist socialist network in Chiapas as a result of the Zapatista revolution? Um, all this to ask, do you imagine the small scale anti-capitalist economies can exist without participatory democracy as a foundation? Um, that's a really good question. So, um, I would say that it is entirely possible for small scale anti-capitalist economies to exist without like a broader participatory democratic structure. Um, for instance, El Cambalache in Chiapas, which is in uh, San Cristobal de las Casas is not part of the Zapatista autonomous zone. Um, uh, San Cristobal is, you know, a, an old colonial city. It's the site of, uh, the actual Mexican state power in the region. <clears throat> um, so like not all of Chiapas is um, part of the Zapatista autonomous self-government. Um, however, um, it's definitely clear that the 
um, this, the, the seizure of, of power over that territory by the Zapatistas it's had a really important impact on the development of cooperative economies. Um, you know, most, most agriculture there now within Thomas autonomous zone is organized as cooperatives. Um, they sell loads of coffee to the international market. Um, that is, you know, through, through a worker ownership structure. And also during the uprising itself, there was a lot of direct expropriation of powerful land owners themselves. Um, so they like kicked out a bunch of asandados and abusive uh, foremen and, and whatnot and took over um, those farms and, um, and, and have run, been running them cooperatively. Uh, so there's like, that, that's a direct consequence of, of the broader democratic struggle. Um, and I, I do think that being able to scale, small scale um, anti-capitalist economies like El Cambalache is, is kind of dependent on having directly democratic political power as well. Um, so I see if any contact with Kali Akuno, uh, well, his, his wife was at, uh, the gathering in in August um, to talk about cooperation Jackson. And yes, uh, they are they are parts of symbiosis. And Mason, just to save you the scrolling through the chat, Kelly and uh -huh. I have a, have been keeping a list. If you want me to just read you, I think there was one Please. more. There were two that you missed. So there was one from at the beginning from Gary when you were first talking about when you opened up about um, the organizing building that builds up to a revolutionary moment beforehand. Um, and Gary said, is this the situation with BLM movement slash revolt? Um, I mean, I, th I think so in part. Uh, obviously, like, it's not a, it's not a, a one, it's not a unitary thing. Um, the, the struggle for Black Lives varies so dramatically from city to city. Um, but in lots of places, this is being driven by um, assemblies in public space. Um, it's been like, now more than um, previous rebellions um, about police violence, there's been the direct seizure and contestation for control of public space. Um, so I think I think I mean the everything everything that is illustrating for ordinary people that if they take to the streets collectively, they can get results is part of this kind of social and movement or uh, educational process. Um, and in all kinds of places that is, that's further maturing into, um, you know, new kinds of participatory organizational forms. So, yeah, I think, I think we're definitely, we're definitely on the road there. And then the last one um, was from Joseph Madison. Was intra-Palestinian conflict an issue during the first intifada? And if so, how would this be dealt with in similar uh, large scale federative efforts? Absolutely. Um, I think one of the, so one of the biggest challenges um, of repression was, um, was basically the question of what to do with collaborators. So um, there were, you know, lots of times in which, um, the security forces would get um, dirt on a given person and leverage that to them to basically blackmail them into to spying on behalf of security forces. Um, oftentimes, this kinds of blackmail was was sexual in nature, um, like identifying someone as as gay or having had some kind of like um, premarital encounter, whether that be consensual or not. Um, you know, obviously, like these kinds of weaknesses in the movement um, are related to broader problems of, of patriarchy and social inequality. Um, and so most, most, the vast majority of intra-Palestinian conflict during the uprising related to, uh, especially in the later years as things were falling apart, related to um, vigilante killings of suspected collaborators. Um, and, you know, people were terrified, people were getting um, rounded up and, and tortured. And, um, and so like, if, if you had reason to believe that someone was feeding information to, uh, to the occupying authorities, that was, you know, the, the, the response that, pe that people took was, um, was like summary executions oftentimes. Um, and so, 
so that was that was like the, the main main problem um if i don't know if you're possibly like referring to other kinds of sources of conflict i mean obviously uh, palestinian society is a religiously diverse one um that really was not as significant of an issue as it has been presently this is really before the um the like political resurgence of of islamism and political islam in palestinian society this was overwhelmingly secular and uh, for many like if, if not if not simply like revolutionary nationalist explicitly leftist struggle um for those who were working through explicitly political organizations um you know many most of whom were uh mixed uh religiously um and how would this be dealt with similar large-scale federative efforts i mean I don't know if we have a good answer to the how do we how do we make our organizations resistant to repression in this way. Um, the Zapatista answer to this question has been to close their doors, basically. Um, you I mean you if you're a random uh, resident of like the territory that they that they control or the surrounding regions, you can't just join the EZLN. Um, you have to be at this stage you have to be born into it to be to be a zapatista and that's entirely as a uh a means of, of resisting infiltration so i mean these the the problems of, of state violence or repression give us lots of really painful dilemmas that um i don't think have have clear-cut answers though we definitely shouldn't uh engage in in bloodletting and uh summary execution of each other on the basis of suspicion because that did not go well and so that's all the ones in the chat. Maybe we can take um, the rest at the end when after we since um, we still have a couple other pieces to get to. Um, um, to yeah, I can hop in. Uh, thanks, Mason. Uh, I think it was an excellent grounding. We a bit of a hard pivot here in, in talking about symbiosis, but I guess to to connect it and saying, of course, we you know, these movements have informed and in inspired uh, the, the politics that we're pursuing and the strategies and, and tactics. So um, not to conflate our, our movement at this time with some of these great successes in, in, uh, in recent history. So uh, yeah, just I, I think, you know, not to rehash too much territory that we have, have trodden, but uh, in terms of just re-summarizing with dual power, kind of two key elements. So building counter institutions at the sites of struggle is one. And the second is really confederating these institutions to build up a base of grassroots counter power, which can eventually challenge the existing power of the state and of, of capitalism head on. Uh, so sort of an institution, building an institution of these institutions. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk very briefly about uh, democratic confederalism, kind of why we saw a need for that uh, in in the movement here and across North America, and a little bit about uh, with symbiosis, the what what the groups involved have built so far. So, why democratic confederation? Uh, we know that the changes that sorry, it's got very windy all of a sudden. So hopefully you can hear me okay. But the changes that are required to secure. Our future are more than what each of us can do at the local level, as critical as those local efforts are. And ruling class power, our ecological crisis, our economic crises are all organized globally. And so to confront them, we have to be as well. And we need the visibility in particular of a common platform uh, with the capacity to support people in developing their own new initiatives, seeding new initiatives in communities, or connecting them to those that already exist to really um, build these power, help to continue building these powerful local institutions and confederating those into a, a regional scale. So we need to escalate our strategy towards building this strong network, this confederation that can share knowledge, that can make decisions together and take action together, all while remaining democratically accountable, such as through recallable delegates from these directly from these communities or assemblies that are participating in the confederation. So symbiosis is just such a confederation of, uh, of community organizations across North America, which is building a democratic and ecological society from the ground up. And what we're fighting for is a better world 
um, by connecting again and seeding new institutions of participatory democracy, the solidarity economy, through community organizing, you know, going neighborhood by neighborhood and city by city. This effort really came to start to take shape in its current incarnation in late 2017, early 2018, and in large part um, connecting sort of uh, like-minded folks and institutions uh, converging in part through uh, these gatherings that the ISE has, has hosted. Um, points of unity for symbiosis, I think Mason shared in the chat yesterday, but j briefly again to summarize, direct democracy, anti-hierarchy, ecology, the solidarity economy, revolution from the ground up, and unity and diversity. I think we've basically defined all of those by this point, just in unity and diversity. I'm not sure we've explicitly called out, but basically looking, you know, beyond the toleration of differences across identity and experience to actually recognizing that this diversity and, and these, these different identities and experiences enrich our ability to do this revolutionary work together, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts and sharing in a common humanity. So just gonna kind of briefly talk about the really the backbone of symbiosis is these member organizations, these local place-based grassroots institutions or institution building movements. Um, who are ultimately constitute the decision-making body of the confederation that, that we're all building together. Uh, so just to give you kind of a, a sense of the scope and, and scale of who's involved, um, institutions from Oaxaca and Mexico, Athens, Athens and Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago and Carbondale, Illinois, Asbury Park, New Jersey, right near where I am, Jackson, Mississippi, of course, Detroit, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Northfield, Minnesota, Olympia, Washington, Portland and Eugene, Oregon, Queens and New York City, upstate New York, Northern California, Calgary, Alberta, Montreal, Quebec are all um, institutions that have been or, or are involved at this point in, in moving this confederation forward. And these sorts of institutions include you know, people's assemblies, mutual aid formations, networks of cooperatives that are building economic democracy in their cities, you know, whether it's time banks, community gardens, community production and digital fabrication, you know, 3D printing has been something Cooperation Jackson's really been on the forefront of. Uh, and just also to, you know, note there's been a role for sort of partner organizations if you're thinking, you know, how are some of these other, uh, you know, institutions, I, I, networks that are maybe less place-based institutions in our movement ecosystem, how do they fit into the strategy and picture? Um, there have been sort of these partner organizations that are you know, ide ideologically aligned allies whose work doesn't necessarily fall into that member organization category, but uh, have an interest in, in seeing this confederation take shape. So some examples of those have been Black Socialists in America, Degro US, uh, Democratic Socialists of America's Libertarian Socialist Caucus, Demand Utopia, uh, the Institute for Social Ecology, of course, Permaculture Action Network, uh, Radio Fogata Ceran, and Roar Magazine, sense of a kind of variety of structures and outlets uh, that have been co-conspirators in this effort. And we, in, in sort of these groups coming together and, and organizing um, this institution, this confederation, uh, really catalyzing event was driving towards this Congress of Municipal Movements, as we call it, which occurred last September in Detroit. And the idea was to actually bring people from each of these institutions together um, for, for kind of three main purposes. So one was connecting these organizers, activists, and thinkers who all share a common strategy and vision for a democratic society to learn from one another, um, to knit together our movement with new and strengthened relationships that have been set essential face-to-face -face work. Second was to deliberate as a gathering of movements through participatory democratic process to determine the vision and structure of the organization that we are, are working to create together. And third was to actually launch this continental confederation of local movements building dual power through this radical democracy. And just to summarize the Congress, I think it was around approximately 150 participants from dozens of these member and partner organizations and, and folks joining throughout the, the week from the local Detroit community was open to, to local uh, organizers and community members as well. I think some 
glimpses of or attempts at prefiguration kind of throughout the space that we were all building together uh, was we had full English and, and Spanish translation to ensure kind of our comrades coming from Mexico and, and from the U.S. could um, you know have a, a, a genuine exchange uh, had a bunch of amazing volunteers from Food Not Bombs locally who demonstrated how to feed this giant group for the better part of a week on nothing but you know donations and short-coded items um, and in terms of resource allocation as well ensuring that folks from um, you know institutions or communities that are, are poor or working class might not otherwise be able to participate uh, kind of you know allocating our resources in a way that is that representatives or participants from those communities were, were able to, to come to Detroit. Um, and of course, you know, we only had a, a week together to advance this project, which felt like it went by really quickly. Um, so recent sort of developments and, and work since the Congress that we've, <laughs> excuse me, undertaken and are continuing to undertake have been you know, developing and approving these consensus points of unity, uh, which was you know, really a, a kind of long and uh, nuanced alignment process, which Mason and others who participated in that can speak more to, I think Dan, Brian as well, uh, developing a, or, or kind of revamping a process for new local member organizations to join to continue you know, building the strength of the Confederation with institutions, more and more institutions from throughout the continent participating, weekly new member orientations. Um, again, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but kind of equity of access to information being foundational part of genuine democracy. Uh, and then there is continuing work to advance the development of a federation-wide spokes council model so we can you know, deliberate and make decisions together. Uh, conflict resolution and alternative adjudication practices. Again, something I mentioned yesterday that a few of us are personally involved in and, and think is really essential to a, a viable institution in the long term. And you know, ultimately, uh, has Symbiosis, I think, has, has attempted to always be a container for, for member organizations to connect you know, in real time and, and share knowledge around most recently COVID-19 response and um, the way that, that groups have been participating in in the current uprising. Uh, so I think I'll stop there. I'm sure we can talk a lot more about this in question and answer, but just for, I guess, to, to end with an invitation, um, there are certainly opportunities to, whether you are part of a, a group that might be, you know, an, a local grassroots uh, institution that would be interested in participating in this confederation and um, building this together. Uh, I'll drop a link for, for if you were part of an institution that would be interested in that, um, definitely welcome. And, and likewise, for sort of at large um, kind of organizing members, if you, if you don't have an institution like that locally that you're connected to, uh, but still want to be part of this project, or if you're actually interested in starting such an institution, uh, which is, you know, ultimately a, a main goal is seeding more and more of these institutions locally, uh, opportunities to participate as well. So I'll drop that link in one second, if someone hasn't already, and gonna hand it back to, or I hand it to Katie and, and back to Mason to talk a little bit about kind of the, the nitty gritty tangibles of, of how uh, this organizing is, is, has been achieved and member organizations have achieved this at, at the local level. Uh, so to, to kind of drive toward uh, something actionable maybe in terms of you know, if you're inspired by these ideas and, and want to try to build something like this, um, some, some thoughts on what's worked and what has worked less well to do that. Um, Thank you. Before oh, yeah, we do ahead. that, there's two questions that have popped up in the chat that have not been responded to that relate to symbiosis specifically. Um, on the international question. Um, first, does anything like this exist in such across the UK? And do you have any international members and partners? Yeah, I know, I mean, there have been some, I think we mentioned this yesterday, organizations that both, you know, we're all kind of wearing multiple hats through the ISC and symbiosis we've engaged with. Um, so there's a, is it Symbiotic Horizon? Is that the name yeah, of it? Yeah, they're in, in they're in Bristol, I think. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so yeah, there's some, there's some, a number of UK groups that have like reached out to us and, um, and, and like European wide, um, ones, um, for scope, we decided early on that like, even if we think this initially should be global, um, to stick to, um, a continental scale at this time seemed like more than enough to bite off. And, um, so, so like we have, we have, we've grown relationships with groups that uh, are related to politics, um, in other countries or outside of North America. Um, but they're not like part of the, the Federation. So we, one of the things we decided that Congress was to, um, you know, authorize formation of an international committee to kind of like intentionally, um, pursue some of these relationships and see where it goes. Um, but, but that's, that's where it's at right now. Um, we have plenty of international individual members who like help with, um, different working groups and stuff. Um, but yeah. Um, so I believe I'm going to take the next section mostly by myself since um, we already made Mason talk for like 45 minutes straight, but I'm also going to use uh, presenter's privilege real quick to say let's move up the break because I personally really need to use the restroom. So let's just take 10 now and then we'll come back. I'll do the kind of practical elements of organizing, um, quick presentation, and then we'll go into um, some in-depth breakouts. So see you all in uh, at the 45 mark.
Hey, Lemmy, we're just on a, a quick bathroom break. To respond to your question in the chat. Are you talking to me? No, Lemmy asked in the chat oh. about why it's so quiet. Oh, okay. Um, and I have to leave at 3.30, but um, just wanted to put my question out there. I was trying to figure out how to formulate it for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, that, whenever you guys get to it. Well, it's a big, it's a big question. I guess I would, I would say two things. Um, one, that building, building like real deeply rooted popular power outside the state is a means of undermining the ability of the state to use violence. Um, you know, that's something that happened. Oh, that's so adorable. I know, I'm just <laughs> uh, you know, Repeatedly, um, I mean, like the, for example, the October Revolution, at least initially, that initial transfer of power um, in Russia was one of the most uh, bloodless that's ever occurred in history because they had, the Soviets had organized um, through the entire army and had more power over what the army would do than than the actual government did, and um, this is. I think this is this is something that um, Hannah Arendt's work is is really useful for for thinking through about um, how eroding the power of states um, is about eroding their their capacity for um, for violence. Um, I think this is also um, what's really exciting about the present moment because so, you know, the, the, the non-reformist demands of the day in the, in the present rebellions are all about things like um, undermining the state's capacity for violence um, through demilitarizing and defunding um, police forces. Uh, yeah. I, I will also say that I think that the other side of this is um, you know, the the dual power that we that we build will require for its survival the the ability to to organize and and, and direct violence. Um, you know that's not just about uh, I'm not even thinking primarily about like overthrowing governments or anything, but um, with with a fascist resurgence almost everywhere um, in in the country. Um, being able to organize community self-defense is, is really critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what I've come, yeah, I think being able to protect ourselves and state and have clear boundaries respected is important. Mm -hmm. And my other thought lately has been, what if we can be so non-threatening that this state's like, well, and I think that that's how a lot of movements get by, but they're not, they're not actually taking power. They're not building power, right. but they're left alone by the state because the state's like, oh, that's innocuous. Like, you don't need, we need, don't need to bother with those weird art, artist hippie types who are moving back to the land and, and feeding themselves. But I think if you have different levels of, of involvement and of, sharing sharing knowledge if you have like different levels of involvement and like then some people are more interested in more just like feeding themselves and creating a new world and other people are more involved in protecting and mediating and uh yeah community what what is the um so defunding the police, there are specific, I don't mean to keep going, but um, th there's a specific terms for defunding the police, like the alternatives. I know it's not community policing, but. Um, community self-defense. Community self-defense, okay. 
It's varying from, think, from place to place too. I mean, there's different platforms being pushed in different contexts based upon what they think they can win politically. But um, I think one of the core functions here is not just um, get rid of cops, but create other forms of public safety that are non-lethal and um, you know, community directed. Community directed. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. It is 2.45, or it's 45 uh, after the hour, no matter what time mm -hmm. zone you're on. So um, we're going to jump back in, I think. Um, Go for it. And then we'll have some time for, for breakouts as well. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this portion relatively quick and efficient. Um, but um, uh, hoping that we can get a lot more into it in breakouts. Um, and sorry, trying to make sure I can see all of you guys in my notes. Um, okay, so when we, um, one of the, uh, well, I guess I'll start by saying as, um, Mason, sort of nicely summarized at the end of um, his historical discussion, um, there's almost always a, a sort of iceberg effect um, going on when there are popular moments or uh, you know, rev revolutionary uh, flashpoints, moments of crisis, um, where things sort of spill over into public consciousness. Um, there's often a much, much deeper well of organizing that's gone on behind the scenes. And so um, I wanted to briefly go through um, some of what what we've identified as some of the 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 principles for doing this in your own community, um, and then we're going to focus breakouts on this as well because I know there's a lot of experience um, in these rooms and a lot of you know appetite for for discussing and fleshing out what this could look like practically for everyone where they live um, or what it does look like if you're already involved in this kind of work. Um, I, uh, this, this list is drawn from um, experiences of member organizations in symbiosis and drawn heavily from the work of our primer working group. So there's a, um, related to symbiosis, there's a symbiosis research collective that um, has been working for the last several years on putting together a primer, which will be a sort of textbook length um, but but break you know able to be broken out into pamphlet sized uh, chapters um, or chapter sized pamphlets uh, of various both some of the historical examples that Mason was talking about some of this, these practical principles some some theory um, and it'll sort of be like a revolutionary textbook um, so those of you who are more inclined to writing and editing we would love to have you get involved in that and I'm drawing um, these principles from uh, drafts of, of that chapter uh, in the primer, as well as publications that I and others have authored um, through the Symbiosis Research Collective um, in the form of articles and essays. Um, so we're, we're calling these kind of the 10 symbiosis principles of organizing, um, and these are kind of in draft form. But um, number one is that you're never starting from scratch. Um, and so I think a lot of us tend to look around our communities if we're not already deeply embedded in local organizing um, and say, you know, there's nothing going on here. Um, I think somebody voiced this in, in my breakout yesterday. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing really happening in my city. It, it seems really utopian to talk about like building a dual power strategy. Where do I even start? Um, and it's definitely true that Plenty of communities lack um, social movement organizations, um, civil movements, mu civic movements, um, much less, you know, truly radical versions of those kinds of organizations, right? Um, but every community, no matter how suburbanized, atomized, um, destroyed by the ravages of neoliberalism, um, has some kind of existing landscape of relationships and human connection um, you know, familial relationships, friendships, um, it, it, the, the, there, are, there are baseline relationships and institutions in every community 
that it would be a mistake to ignore. Um, and when we try to organize by sort of proceeding as though there is a blank slate around us um, and that we are the initiators of all like institutions or human connection or relationships, um, it's, it's not gonna be effective for a vari uh, variety of reasons. Um, you'll miss kind of what's already there that could be built on so that you're not reinventing the wheel. And um, the people that you're organizing with will also notice the difference between being treated as a blank slate and being treated by, you know, as somebody who you actually want to build a relationship with and know kind of what's going on in their lives, right? Um, so that's, you know, sometimes called community mapping, but basically the first task is to understand what is already in place interpersonally, socially, relationally, um, and then also institutionally or organizationally. Um, this is not to say that you shouldn't be skeptical of or critical of existing institutions. Um, so I uh, have some experience uh, in the very traditional Alinsky, Salt Alinsky based uh, community organizing or American community organizing tradition. Um, and uh, as those of you who, who um, might be familiar with it would know, um, that tradition really emphasizes what it calls institution-based organizing um, as and argues for only working through existing institutions. Almost, and in the Slavic Alinsky tradition, it, it's um, largely faith-based institutions. Um, the problem with, with that um, is that, you know, often those types of institutions are intensely hierarchical and they don't come, they, they come with their own set of values often, which are often um, can be patriarchal, homophobic, um, classist in the example of, you know, prosperity gospel faith traditions um, and, um, and a whole, I have a whole lot of other sort of, sort of institutional baggage um, in even when we're talking outside of the faith. And I say this as a, as a, um, a practicing Catholic from the kind of liberation theology tradition. So not to disparage any faith traditions, but just to say that um, using these as a basis for the foundation of a new society is maybe not um, not the most uh, democratic or effective approach. Um, these in, and then so even outside of you know faith-based institutions, when we talk about labor in, labor organ, uh, organizations or other types of existing institutions, um, those two can often be extremely hierarchical. Um, and the reality is also, as many of us know, um, many of these institutions in our communities are crumbling because of the effects of neoliberalism and um, the, you know, uh, decline in availability of public space. Um, so secular institutions that used to be really fertile ground um, for, for building uh, local community have often been really um, impacted by the um, the destruction of uh, public space and the lack of access to things like recreation centers and public libraries where you can meet and um, support from the city, you know, for budgets for things like block clubs or um, other community institutions. Um, so, so you know, figure out what's what's there on the ground, but um, also, you know, do that with a critical eye. Um, the second is start with relationships. So this is something that I already, I already um, touched on a little bit, but if we, if we think of movements as really complex objects or organisms, relationships between people are like the atoms that make, make up those, those really complex um, uh, beings, right? They're kind of the most fundamental building blocks of organizing. Um, there's no organizing popular power movement, anything without relationships. Um, so, you know, two kind of main, main reasons for that um, is that, so one, relationships are the means by which people come together to recognize our common interests and goals, right? They break us out of that siloed individual condition, which especially in um, the present moment in places like the United States, we are so entrenched in um, and help us to kind of understand how our circumstances are intertwined with those around us. Um, and then the second reason that they're fundamental is that those bonds between us are what make collective action possible, right? So without that social glue, 
there's no reason to put um, your your life uh, or uh, you know things that are are dear to you on the line unless you are personally being threatened in an individual moment um, and without collective action you know there's not really the possibility of changing anything um, so uh, essentially start by building relationships um, and this is so another thing I you know I guess my, my response to go back to that that question that I um, often hear people say like there's nothing going on around me where do I even begin um, my response would be do you have neighbors? Because if so, um, and in the ever more urbanized globe, the answer is almost always yes, you have, you have some people who live near you, then you have people you can start organizing with. Um, the part two of that question is, oh, but none of my neighbors agree with me and they're all like really, you know, ideologically different. And um, yeah, there will be ideological differences. Not everyone is going to agree with you. And part of what building a vibrant public sphere means is creating the space for disagreement and debate. Um, and that brings us back to this, this underlying point about relationships, because building actual relationships of trust between one another allows us to then discuss and debate differences of opinion and also challenge firmly held beliefs um, that may be hierarchical, that may be, um, you know, uh, unequal from a place of trust rather than a place of anger and alienation. And we know that this political education is vital to building a world that is receptive to a new system. Um, the other thing I'll say on this point is that people might surprise you, right? So um, I think we often tend to assume that our neighbors are all of a certain cast of mind um, when, you know, the reality is, um, most people in the U.S. have experienced some kind of economic instability in their lives. Most people, um, I mean, like most people around the, around the globe, um, right, and and have experienced other ways in which the state and um, modern day capitalism have have negatively impacted them, um, and and so reactions might be more positive than you might think to some of. Um, the ideas that we're talking about. Um, the other thing, and this is something that Mason discussed, uh, you know, with the Zapatistas in particular, but from keeping in mind that you don't have all the answers, right? So we need to be open to changing our own minds as opposed to approaching all situations as though we are like educators who already have the exact correct ideology um, preformed that we're going to lay out for the masses. <laughs> um, but it is helpful to have uh, to have a group of people that do share your ideals and, um, you know, maybe are specifically democratically, you know, specifically interested in democratic confederalism or libertarian municipalism. Um, and that is where things like study groups or ideological affinity groups can help provide an ongoing base for, for your own political education and then also strategizing on how best to sort of communicate those ideas um, to people who might be unfamiliar with them. Um, I'll run through the next pretty quickly. Um, so number three is identify leaders. So part of forming relationships with people in your community is figuring out who else has taken time to build strong relationships with people um, in your community. Who do your neighbors or coworkers look to for advice, support, um, initiative? Who shows willingness to dedicate their energy to community projects? Um, who can get other people to show up? Um, and I think especially in the context of directly democratic anti-hierarchical organizing, um, identifying uh, these qualities and then also building them in um, ourselves and others is, is really vital. Um, Non-hierarchical non uh, non organizing doesn't mean, uh, and rotational organizing doesn't mean leaderless organizing, it means developing these, these capabilities in more people, right? Um, uh, number four is, and this is something we've talked a lot about this weekend, um, make it worth your community members while, right? So institutions that we're talking about building can't be sustained if they're just ends in and of themselves. Um, most people need reasons to participate in something that are grounded in more than just the belief that direct democracy is like a good abstract ideal. 
right? So it's crucial to identify what kinds of immediate and manageable issues affect the you and the people around you that you can start organizing from. Um, and that's not to say that, that uh, you know, to, to contrast with the traditional community organizing approach, that's not to say that every uh, piece of organizing should be that, you, you know, issue-based and concrete and winnable. Um, you know, we're not saying that you, you shouldn't have a broader transitional program in mind, um, but the institutions that we're building need to be able to meet people's immediate needs um, as opposed to just sort of working towards a future goal. Um, number five is to broaden the possibilities for uh, participation. So not everybody sitting through community meetings isn't everyone's thing and we need to get a little more creative in ways that people can participate as well as finding ways to make community meetings where decisions are being made open to more people, right? And we've talked about ways that child care cooperatives and you know, transportation help and all those kinds of things can be really important in making, um, making uh, involvement accessible in meetings, but also finding ways to do things together and act collectively outside of assemblies or meetings um, is really important. Um, number six is people know what they need. So um, we might have ideas or about issues or projects that we can work on based on what we've seen in our community, but we, you know, our neighbors also have ideas of things that they're missing and things that they need and um, we'll have all sorts of ideas you may not have thought of. Um, number seven is collective action is the best teacher. So we talked about political education being really important, but it's by actually doing things together and acting collectively that people start to really believe that systemic change is possible. Um, so, so kind of getting out there and, and, and doing collective action as a group as soon as possible is really important. Um, institutionalize. So uh, is number eight. So um, making a clear formal structure that's so that people outside of your immediate web of relationships can participate um, and can work through a democratic process and that what you've built can last past you, um, which leads directly into number nine, which is to make yourself replaceable. So professional organizers often say that their job is to organize themselves out of a job. And though most of us may not be doing this for pay, uh, the same principle needs to apply. So our work needs to be sustainable. And that will also help avoid that burnout issue we talked about earlier. Um, and then number 10 is um, as you build the base, scale up. So everywhere you look, there are examples of individual projects that uh, might meet one or two of the criteria that we've talked about with dual power institutions, right? But operating alone, um, they can't create dual power. And without a wider unified base of support, many just fizzle out over time. Um, every city has its sort of graveyard of nonprofits, cooperatives, social clubs, community centers. Um, and we really need that next step of starting to link those together into an infrastructure of uh, political democracy and solidarity economy um, so that can mutually reinforce each other's initiatives and cultivate um, a, an ability to take on sort of citywide and regional power relations um, and actually, actually uh, change where we live. So I will um, end there. We're a little after three, so that gives us 40, 45 minutes for breakouts and then 15, 20 minutes for report backs. Um, and, oh, I guess we haven't taken questions for these, but I think in the interest- There have been too many that are direct questions. Okay, cool. Um, and I think I would just encourage people uh, who, who do have questions or I haven't been able to keep up with the chat while I've been chatting, but um, to just raise them in your individual groups and then we can talk about them in report backs too. I wanna give people as much time to talk um, with each other as possible. So our breakout questions, I will post um, again in the chat, um, basically after introductions, which we always do and identifying a note taker or report backer. Um, what is something that I or we want to do in our community that we can learn how to do uh, from other groups who have experienced doing it. Um, so this, this goes back to that symbiosis question, like what, if you are organizing locally, what are 
some things that you would love to learn about how to do from other groups doing this around a continent or um, around the world. What is sort of the reverse of that question? What's something we have experienced doing that we could teach other groups? Um, and then what's something that can be achieved through coordinating with groups who are not in my immediate area? So those are the sort of democratic confederalism questions. Um, and then, um, so I'm just typing these to put in the chat. Um, and then the other piece is um, sort of how would you go about or how have you gone about if you've already done this, um, starting to organize in your immediate community. Um, I think just similar to yesterday, if folks could use a kind of round Robin style, make sure each person has the opportunity to speak on these questions, they can always pass, but explicitly making that space. So whoever's facilitating, do that. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pop these into the chat. And we have 41 people, so we can do five rooms, four rooms. Maybe five rooms if we're going around round yeah. robins take a little longer. So okay. Um, and we will come back here in 40 minutes. 42 minutes. See you all then.
Uh, Max, do you still need to be sorted? Hello? Hello? Good morning. Yeah, I got, uh, I lost connection to the breakout group and I'm trying to get back on. Hey Gary, I, I've only just joined myself. So I don't, I haven't been in a breakout room. I haven't been assigned. So I think we're just in, in waiting limbo. Yeah, I don't. This happened to me yesterday. I don't know what happened. Everything froze, and all of a sudden, I was kicked out. So, yeah, and I was I volunteered to facilitate it. Oh no! <laughs> oh. Well, there you go. Anyway, you are Urs. I'm Urs. Yeah. Good morning. It's um, seven thirty here. Where are you here. from? Where are you from? I live in New Zealand. Oh, you in New Zealand? Wow. Yeah. Well, welcome. I'm from uh, Winooski, Vermont. Nice. Cool. I haven't joined any other sessions. I was busy over the weekend with other things. Um, so this is the first time I logged on. So, um, oh, yeah, we'll oh, great. I'm sorry you missed yesterday and today. Uh, this I was it. It was excellent. Cool. But it's good that you're, you're on right now. Yeah, I, I can't stay for long. I've got to get the kids ready for school and things like that. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd quickly join and see who's around. And oh, excellent. I hope that um, 
or you'll be able to join tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see how we go. And um, what's the session on at the moment? Where are we in the program? Well, they were talking about dual power. Um, where it's the afternoon session. Yeah, you're, you're dealing with dual power, organizing to address immediate needs while at the same time challenging uh, the state and yet at the same time creating uh, alternative structures, institutions to the state. Um, so the breakout was, you know, talking about uh, how to do that or examples that people have done. Uh, some of the examples that were given in such efforts.
Axel, can you drop the name and author of that book you were referencing in the chat so we have it in the transcript? I would love to follow up on that. Welcome back, everyone. So we have um, 10 minutes, and I think we had five rooms. Uh, did we have five rooms or four rooms? Anyway, basically two minutes a room, if we can keep it to that, um, for report backs. So who wants to go first? If anyone's trying to talk, you're muted. Uh, well, I'd be happy to go first and speak for our group. Sure. Okay. Um, we had uh, Kelly from New Jersey in the USA, Matt from Pittsburgh in the USA, Kelly from Chicago in the USA, Blair from around Seattle in the USA, Vanya from California in the USA, um, 16 from, I, I think, Brussels, if I've got that right. Um, Lemmy in Western South Asia, Aporva in Delhi, and Ors in um, New Zealand. Um, and uh, for the first question, we talked quite a bit about um, resource sharing, and I'm sort of grouping together like skill sharing as well as physical resources like equipment, um, as well as just generally training with how to interact with the organization. Um, uh, Blair and 16 brought up some interesting uh, examples from organizations in, in Europe um, and how they were organized and sort of had um, like equipment at the ready for people to use often with um, uh, storage lockers um, uh, that uh, people could, could enter into. Um, Blair mentioned that they try, have been implementing something similar to that in um, uh, uh, his local DSA chapter as well. Um, uh, 16 mentioned that a lot of these, um, organizations are often, um, uh, confederated, um, so that there's a larger umbrella organization that will, um, sort of hold on to resources and take care of training and things like that. But that, that can also cause problems because when you have high turnover, you have a lot of people that you need to train all of the time. Um, and it can get a little bit blurry, um. Uh, we talked about other things that uh, we were looking for, like um, the problem of allocating free furniture that our people are leaving outside during the pandemic, um, and uh, and the problem of allocating like medical and uh, first response skills. Um, then uh, for the next questions of, um, hang on a sec. Uh, uh, how can we start? I, I think we, we talked quite a bit about um, understanding the community and what their needs are and what sorts of organizations already exist that are doing what we're talking about doing. Um, and uh, we talked about some of the um, work that's being done on like, for example, Google Docs right now, where people are making these big lists of music mutual aid organizations that you can contribute to. Um, and sort of working to get that organized so that we're, we're sure that resources are going to the places that need them the most. Um, and um, I don't want to go on for too long, but there was so much yeah, good stuff. Yeah, I think we may have to up. wrap you up there. Okay, yeah, Just sorry. to have time for everyone. No, no, that's, that's okay. Fair. Thank you. Sounds like you guys had a great conversation. Mm -hmm. um, next group. Hi, I'm uh, Nuri, um, and hi, Lemmy, now you know my voice. Um, I was in a group with, I wrote down the list, um, okay, Axel, Aaron, um, uh, oh my god, my, my notes are a little bit, uh, Jeff, Ollie, and Katie. Um, uh, there, were, there were many topics, and I think I will have to, uh, at the end of this, um, write something longer, because there were so many very good ideas, and my notes are so big, and it takes a while to uh, condense them. I'll briefly say, that um, Axel had um, was working on uh, was something wonderful called an immediate fashion school, which playfully challenges dominant systems and narratives, you know, along patriarchy, racism, and capitalism. So it's not just clothing the body, but it, like expands to include everything. And she talked about uh, funding issues. So one of the difficulties that Katie also elaborated on um, 
is uh, how to obtain uh, funding in a very hostile environment and also uh, to demonopolize uh, leadership. Uh, she's t she was talking about how to open up leadership, you know, how to replace herself um, and, and so forth. Um, also, I believe it was, um, I, I, I maybe I got the name wrong, so I won't say it. Um, uh, it was one person who was working on uh, student activism. Uh, so uh, a gate for change is the name of the org, um, which organizes activism on campus. It's a broad based social activism. So not just like one environmentalism group, but ties together various issues um, for people who, you know, want to uh, deal with, as I understand, a number of issues, you know, th there's a lot of issues that um, uh, are tangential and that they can combine. Um, and to demonopolize, you know, um, power, uh, they sort of are there to facilitate facilitate ideas of whoever wants to show up. So um, there's nobody stuck in a position that only so and so knows how to deal with this or holding power over the group. Um, and they they reduce their scope, so they're not, uh, you know, like being the puppet master or whatever, being the central organization. But I meaning people just bring up ideas, and they're a platform rather than an org where you necessarily implement everything. Um, on the question of how to deal with internal threats to your demo democratic structure, in other words how to um, deal with problematic people who take up a lot of time oftentimes. Katie uh, explained um, about how uh, to, to, to build um, processes that um, uh, don't take up that much time, for example, for victims who have been, you know, who, who have experienced harm from say, for example, a, 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 an abuser or at least alleged abuser. Um, uh, to deal with that in a way that also does not um, drive away. Like there, there's two things that may happen. Either you get people into endless process or you sort of do nothing and drive away oftentimes very experienced, um, uh, oftentimes uh, women who, who decide, okay, this is uh, you know, not, they, they see the writing on the wall and they end up leaving. Um, and so, um, and I'll expand on this later on in, in whatever essay I write um, that, yeah, she, talked about the process and I'll deal with that, but I think I'm way over time, so I'll just be quiet now and let the next person speak. Thank you, Nuri. Um, I think so we've heard from, I know our group was number four. I don't know what group yours was, Matthew, or if people remember their group numbers, but okay. I don't remember the number, but um, yeah, go for it. I, we still need to report back. So um, we had um, some challenges with with the questions, but a um, number of helpful responses. I think just, uh, well, it's just an overview who was, who was in the group. We had uh, Katie and Joe, both from uh, England, uh, Liana in Western Massachusetts, myself in Detroit, Joe in Boston, Laura in Connecticut, uh, Ashley and Mike in Somerville, and Max in Providence, Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Um, when when it came to um, things that we want to learn from other groups, um, there were all kinds of different things that that people said. Um, you know, learning more about how to um, do immediate organizing with people in one's block or uh, with neighbors, and trying to like um, get through the barriers of um, between us and having. Um, these important conversations with with people who are starting out as strangers, um, wanting to learn about um, what kinds of uh, tenant union structures we can use that would encourage participation from people who aren't experienced organizers, um, wanting to learn how to best set up community land trusts um, and some other things. Um, so like lots of things we wanted to learn were pretty practically oriented. Um, I noticed with the second question that a lot of things that we wanted to teach were more are at the level of ideas rather than um, concrete skills. Um, and people, um, you know, frame the response in terms of like being able to bring, it, bring a deeper level of analysis um, you know, in, in intersectional terms to organizing questions that, you know, aren't, aren't broadly understood, um, being able to uh, pass on the knowledge that's been gathered um, from one's experience with the Kurdish struggle um, that can be useful um, from the radical left. Um, and um, for, we didn't, we didn't unfortunately have enough time to get through uh, all of us for, for the following questions, but 
Um, those just did respond. We're just kind of seeing the next steps is um, trying to go really deep in where we're at um, and try to, you know, look to other projects, spaces like this one um, to, to get some guidance and support uh, for how we do that. Sweet, thank you. Um, any other breakout groups? I think there was one more. Uh, uh, you're muted. I'll go after you, Alex. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Um, just uh, one sec before you do, because I know it's the top of the hour. Blair, um, when do we start tomorrow? Just for people who do have to drop right away. Uh, same time, 10 o'clock. It's the uh, Democracy in an Age of Crisis and Unreason panel with Saladin Ahmed, Haya Heller, and myself. It'll be discussing a lot of the issues that have been brought up so far. Like, how do we think about direct democracy in the context of racism, sexism, post-truth, irrationality, um, fascism globally. Sweet, so 10 a.m. if you have to drop now, please join us for that tomorrow, same link, et cetera. Go ahead, Alex. All right, um, so apologies that I didn't really get everyone's name or where they are, but um, just very broadly, uh, one of the things that we talked about was um, learning from and kind of being um, allies to indigenous struggles. Um, so whether that's in Hawaii with Mauna Kea, um, learning from how they build governance um, on the mountain rooted in native Hawaiian culture. Um, uh, we also had a kind of larger discussion around um, identity politics, um, the kind of necessity of it, but also maybe the insufficiency or the ways in which um, there are kind of um, problems in analysis that don't, that aren't very helpful. Um, but one of the things that people uh, were really interested in learning about or the, the issues that they had were kind of building coalition, um, getting more people into organizations so it's not just the same people um, a lot of experience around um, tenants organizing that was shared, um, experience of organizing garden groups and how that brings people together, different types of people and how that's rooted in land and food. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a, a good amount of our time was thinking about um, how we can have better analysis in our movements um, and how kind of um, some analysis holds us back, whether that's uh, lack of structural analysis or um, essentializing um, lack of intersectionality, those sorts of things that was really, in some ways, kind of the one of the cores of the things that we talked about. So, Awesome, thank you. Um, was there one last group? I think Gary is trying yeah. to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, my apologies, uh, I got disconnected <laughs> for some reason. Uh, I was gonna volunteer to kind of facilitate and take notes. And so um, I couldn't get everybody's location. So I do apologize for that. We had Andy Thompson, Zach, uh, Peter, uh, Christian, uh, Jenny, Nick, and myself in the group. Um, there was a lot of work around housing issues and the challenges with that. For example, Zach mentioned about New Haven, um, the difficulties to organize um, housing and tenants' rights there. Um, unfortunately, he's having to move to go to uh, Boston for his graduate work. Um, Peter. I, I miss it, the country where he's from, but I, that was really interesting. I was talking about, supposedly they had a majority government voted in, but it turned out to be a neoliberal, a neo-colonial government and how to organize uh, his uh, citizens around addressing that inequality. And they're looking at education, particularly educating local communities about the colonial history, in other words, reclaiming their history, which was being whitewashed um, by the neo-colonial government. And 
he had a great quote, to destroy a people, you destroy their history. So it was a really interesting example of doing community organizing, which is to reclaim the people's history. Uh, Christian talked about in his country, territorials assembly, how to establish food um, sovereignty by uh, solidifying food networks instead of using the marketplace and also women's assembly as a source of power, though there are challenges in doing uh, that kind of organizing. Um, with Andy Thompson, it was the same thing about food sovereignty. Um, a lot of work apparently um, addressing the situation of migrants, but she expressed frustration how even though this work is supposed to have been helping migrants, how often they get left out in the history of it or the description of what's going on. So even if it, those who are trying to work on this issue, quite often the people they're working with uh, who are doing organizing get left out of the narrative and how to address that. Uh, Jenny also was working on food sovereignty um, the, in their neighborhoods to become less dependent on capitalistic uh, food markets. Um, and I didn't get to hear mixed work on what he was doing in North Carolina with addressing police brutality and abolition of police and prisons. And then for me real quick, um, I talked about how with DSA and with Solidarity, uh, which is a socialist organization in the United States, addressing um, economic environmental racism, one where the city of Dallas has been cutting back on mass transit for the poor, predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods, focusing on rail systems for upper class neighborhoods and the developers. Uh, and then also a toxic waste dump site in a uh, black neighborhood that was slated for a super fun cleanup site, but the EPA and the governments never said anything to people about the danger that was in their neighborhood. And we were able to make connections with some uh, noted black activists in those neighbors, neighborhoods who helped us to do grassroots organizing uh, to where we were able to get a lot of petitions to petition the city of Dallas's uh, mass transit authorities to not cut back on certain services, as well as with regard to the Superfund cleanup site, facilitate the formation of a local community group that took the lead organizing wise around the issue of that toxic waste dump site, but we were there to help be a support to them, um, which was pretty exciting work, I have to say. So that's pretty much our report. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think that is everyone. So um, we will end there for today. Apologies for going a few minutes over. Um, thank you all for a wonderful uh, discussion and we will look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 10 a.m. for those of you who can join. Um, and a reminder that the full schedule was emailed out to you um, at the beginning of the week and is also available on the ISE website.